Hello and welcome back. This is the week seven lecture. So today we need to start talking about our final assignment. The final paper It's obviously our biggest assignment and we're really going to spend this week and next week talking about it and just getting ready uh, to complete it. So uh, we are nearing the end of the semester. As you guys are probably aware, uh, this is the second to last week. So we are entering week seven. This is only a week eight. This is only an, an eight week course. So the final paper will be due right after the end of week eight. So a little bit different from what we normally do. Typically all of our assignments are due on the Sunday night, uh, sort of at the end of that respective week. But I'm gonna give you guys a couple of extra days to work on the final paper. So it's going to be due on a Tuesday, right after week eight, Tuesday, August 9th. That's our final deadline. You have to get the papers into me that day so I can get grades entered soon after. So uh, we, we are on a pretty tight timetable, but if you guys follow my schedule and if you get started on some really important preliminary work that you need to do this week, then you'll be ready to start writing and actually putting your papers together next week. All right, and that's really our goal. So I wanna talk about a few different things today. I wanna to talk about just the parameters of the assignment, what I'm expecting, what you guys need to do, sort of what the paper is going to look like, and then I want to get you guys started on some of those preliminary activities that I just mentioned. And for us, that really means researching, uh, picking a text to write about, that's relatively easy, but then we also need to take the time to revisit that text, annotate, you know, take notes, and start brainstorming, start getting some ideas down on paper so we can really get started on the writing part next week. So we are going to talk a little bit today about the writing process. I think we mentioned it back at the beginning of the semester when we were first getting started. And I know a lot of you remember talking about or hearing about the writing process back in 102 or some previous English course. But it is important at times like these when we have a big essay assignment to tackle, it really does help to follow the various stages of the writing process. So we're really starting with pre-writing this week. That means everything that we need to do before we actually start working on our drafts. Uh, so let me start by just uh, pointing a few things out. So I posted something sort of around the middle of last week uh, that you guys might have noticed and I really should have made an announcement or sent out an email. I apologize that I didn't sort of make a bigger deal about this document that I posted. It's called Strategies for Analysis or it might just be uh, called Analysis Strategies. I can't quite remember what I titled it but you should see it in the week six module and I'm going to repost it this week in the week seven module. So you'll have access to it. It's just a, a little word document, but it has some really uh, helpful strategies that would have helped you guys on the analysis assignment that was due at the end of week six. But don't worry if you didn't notice it in time for that. The document is really there to help you with our final paper. Uh, and just some easy strategies that you guys can try out when you're trying to generate original uh, analysis, original interpretation. That's what we're going to be talking about more today because that's really our number one goal with the literary research paper. Obviously, we're doing research. Uh, obviously, we're continuing to work with elements and doing a lot of the stuff that we've already been doing. Uh, there might be a little summary. There's going to be a little bit of response. You should spend a little bit of time doing close reading. So all of the stuff that we've already been doing, and of course, analysis plays a huge part as well, and we just practice that too. So it's gonna be a lot of the stuff we've already been doing. The research is a new element that we'll talk about today. But keep in mind, above all else, we are analyzing and we are interpreting. That means we are making original arguments. The interpretation that we offer 
is the original argument that we want to make. So I really want you guys to think about these final papers as argumentative papers. Think back to English 102. I know some of you took it very recently because you took it with me. And the rest of you probably can remember your 102 class. You probably had to do an argumentative research paper at the end of that class. What we are doing now is similar. Uh, we're, we're, we're writing about literature, which you probably did not do in 102, but we're still making arguments and we're still providing support largely through research, but also through our own ideas. We're offering support for our original ideas, our original points, and it's all working to drive home that overall argument. So again, if you haven't seen the document yet, just take a look at analysis strategies. It's a Word doc. It's in the modules. And again, I am sorry for not calling your attention to it last week because it probably would have come in handy last week uh, because you guys did have an assignment due. But I, I was in the middle of moving. If I can offer a lame excuse, you might notice that my backdrop is different today. Uh, I recently moved. I'm not finished on packing yet. So I have a lot of blank space in here. But uh this is my new recording studio. <laughs> Not really, but uh, it's a better setup than my previous spot. So hopefully in time, it'll look nice. But you caught me on like my second day in the new apartment. So I'm sorry, it still looks a bit unfurnished. All right, so take a look at that uh, analysis strategies document. In addition to the strategy, stuff like surface depth, patterns, also, theoretical lens, pay attention to that one because we just talked about different theories of literary criticism last week. But if you go down to the bottom of the first page, you'll also see some questions that you can use. Just basic questions centered around a lot of the literary elements that we've talked about, like characters, setting, and just some questions you can ask yourself about the text that you're going to write on. You don't have to go through each one of those questions. You don't have to be exhaustive. You don't have to do it all. But there are some questions in there that you can ask. And your answer to the questions will be a way to generate analysis. Your answers to those questions might give you a body paragraph. It might give you a really important supporting point that you want to develop in your paper. So those are just ways to get started. You don't have to use all of that stuff in the document, just sort of pick and choose, try some things on for size and see what works for you. See what allows you to start generating some ideas because you guys probably know from earlier English classes, that's really important when you get started on a big paper. A lot of students just wanna jump right to the writing. They wanna get right to drafting, but that's really the second stage of the writing process. You can't rush it. The first stage is pre-writing, and that's largely just brainstorming, just coming up with ideas. Sometimes we call it idea generation. You know, that's another way to think about pre-writing. You're just getting some ideas down on paper. And the sort of final pre-writing activity that you should complete uh, later this week is outlining. And we're going to talk more about the outline. You guys will have a chance to turn in an outline at the end of this week. You can also turn in a rough draft if you're ready. I'm sort of leaving it up to you guys. But I'm a big fan. I'm a big proponent of outlines. Some students don't want to do them, don't think they're necessary. But outlines are really, really helpful. And once we get some ideas on paper, we can outline in order to get organized. And then once we're organized then we're ready to start drafting. Then we're ready to actually start writing. So I want you guys to really follow the steps and stages of the writing process. So again, that document that I posted, that's really geared for pre-writing and idea generation as you guys start to think more about the text that you want to write about. But now let's actually talk about the assignment itself because I haven't discussed it previously. So the assignment link is available in the week seven module. So please check it out, read my instructions, all of the uh, rules and parameters are there. But again, I really wanna focus on the sort of conceptual level 
today. Uh, because it can be very easy when we're working with literature to sort of slide into summary, to spend a lot of time, like we've said before, it's easy to spend a lot of time sort of recapping the events of the plot, or we can lapse into kind of an informal response mode, which is okay sometimes. We've done response. Sometimes that's appropriate. But I, I want you guys to remember that now we're doing something different. So if you go back to whenever it was, week three, I don't know, early in the semester, when we talked about different types of uh, writing on literature, like different ways you can write about literature, we talked about you know summarizing, we talked about responding, we talked about about uh, close reading, also often called explication, that sort of you know, key strategy handed down by the formalists. And we also talked about analysis. So analysis is kind of where we end up. That's where we are now. And we practiced doing some analysis last week, and now we're continuing in that vein. So again, our two key words when we're thinking about the final paper, it is a literary research paper. And what that means for us is interpretation and analysis. They go hand in hand. You're analyzing throughout your body paragraphs, throughout the paper, and then your end goal is to arrive at that original interpretation. You're going to frame it as your thesis, and then you're going to spend the whole paper proving it, illustrating it, making us accept it, uh, or at least view it as valid. Uh, so again, very much like other argumentative writing that you've done in the past. It's really important that you guys get argumentative now. I know with literature, sometimes we're not as comfortable taking a stand. We're not as comfortable making a strong argument because maybe we're not 100% sure that we're interpreting the text correctly. Maybe we don't know if that's what the author intended, though the formalists would tell us, don't worry about that. That's the intentional fallacy. You don't have to care what the author meant once the text is published. It's really out of the author's hands. Uh, but we have a lot of concerns, right? Sometimes we just might not really be comfortable taking a firm stand, especially if it's a very famous or celebrated work of literature, we might just stop at saying it was good or it's open to interpretation. It can mean a lot of different things. And that's fine in certain situations when we're responding, when we're doing more informal writing, if we're doing like a discussion post or something, if we're just talking. But now we're analyzing. We are interpreting. So we have to have an argument. We have to have a particular angle, a particular point, a particular just overarching argument that we are putting forward. We have to have an original contribution that we are making. Okay, it's not enough to just summarize the text. It's not enough to repeat what some of your outside sources say because that can be an easy trap to fall into as well. We're gonna talk about research. Once we start doing research, you're gonna read other people's interpretations of your chosen text, and it can be easy to basically just summarize that and say, this guy said this, she said that, this other person said this other thing. Uh, of course, we want to use sources, but we're using them to support our own points. We're using the sources to support our own argument our own interpretation so keep that in mind that's really important as we get started so one of the first things that you guys need to do this week is choose your text okay using our textbook of course we have barely scratched the surface of the reader portion of our textbook so you guys have probably noticed we have the instructional chapters in the textbook, which we've been reading, you know, we've been reading a lot of those, including last week when we tackled chapter nine. And then we have all of the literature, all of the literature selections. And we've only read a handful of those. I really wish we could have had time to read more. But the good news is now you guys can choose something that looks good, something that catches your eye. And I want you guys to write about any text in the book as long as you have not previously written about it. Let's not go back and try to capture our greatest hits from a few weeks ago, all right? If you've already written about a text, 
it's off limits. But as long as you haven't written about it, it's fair game. And it doesn't matter if I assigned that particular text earlier in the semester or not. If you guys look at the syllabus, you'll see that here at the end, I'm not assigning specific literary texts anymore. I don't think we really have time to do a bunch of extra reading. I want you guys to read in a very pragmatic, practical way. Uh, which means find the text that you want to do. Maybe if you've already read it, that's great. If you read it back in week three or when we were doing fiction, poetry, or drama, whatever, uh, and you liked it but you haven't had a chance to write about it yet, then sure, go back to it, revisit it, refresh your memory, and you can definitely write about it. Or you can just flip through the table of contents. You can just look for something that you haven't seen yet it's in the book, but I haven't assigned it, so you haven't read it, and you can use one of those as well. But put some thought into your selection. One of the biggest mistakes that students make, not just in literature classes, but in any writing intensive class, is when it comes time to choose a topic for their big paper, they'll make rushed or ill-considered Decisions. They'll just pick something maybe because it seems easy or because they wrote a paper about it back in high school or they figure they can find a lot of info about it online or the story is short so it seems like it would be easy. Uh, those are not really good choices. You need to base your selection on your taste. What do you like? What speaks to you? What moves you? What intrigues you? Find a text that does at least some of those things, okay? Find a text that you are legitimately, genuinely interested in. Because I assure you, the whole process that you're going to be undertaking over the next two weeks will go a lot more smoothly if you pick a text that you like, a text that you think is fun to read, interesting, thought-provoking, very emotionally powerful, whatever. It really doesn't matter what your reasoning is. Uh, it just has to be a text that means something to you. If you don't care about it, if you don't like it, and you don't want to spend a lot of time with it, these next two weeks are going to be unpleasant. And because you're having such a bad time, you're probably going to end up not putting in the time and effort needed to get a good grade. So everything goes better if you have a text that you enjoy, a text that you are legitimately interested in. So that's step one. Go to the book and make your choice. Now, sometimes people ask me, well, can I write about two stories? Can I write about multiple uh, texts in the book? I, I think generally speaking, no. If you're going to pick fiction, okay, if you're going to select a short story, I would usually say just go with one, okay, uh, especially if it's got some substance, if there's a lot going on and you have a lot to say about it, you don't need to bring in another story. That really just creates more work for you and the whole project becomes bigger and a little bit overwhelming potentially. Now, and the same is true with plays, if you're going to go with drama or fiction, I would say just select one single text. But if you want to go in the poetry direction, if you want to write about poetry and you're working with some very short lyric poems, then yeah, potentially you could write about two, maybe even three. But here's the thing to remember. If you want to go that route, you have to show us, the audience, why you're grouping these two or three poems together. They have to have thematic similarities or they have to have uh, similarities based on form, based on structure. Maybe they all use similar rhyme schemes. Maybe there's similar imagery. Uh, you can go back to any of the elements, any of the stuff that we talked about during our poetry week. And if you see something, uh, one of those elements at work in all three poems, or if all three poems are, you know, linked in some other way, maybe by subject matter uh, or whatever, then yeah, you can make that work. You can put them together, but you have to make it clear why you're putting them together. I had a student last semester, not to make fun of anybody, but he chose three poems that were just totally 
unrelated. One was from like the 1500s, one was from maybe the 1800s, and one was contemporary. Now that might actually be cool if you can show some kind of trend, some kind of theme, some kind of feature that's at work in all three of these texts that are separated by so much time. But he didn't do that. He just spent a little bit of time on poem one, a little bit of time on poem two, a little bit of time on poem three. Don't do that. Okay, that's not an effective strategy. He didn't have an argument about all three. He was just talking about them sort of uh, casually without much of an overarching connecting thesis. So people make that mistake pretty often. That's just an example <laughs> that's fresh in my mind. Um, don't do that. Okay, so if you want to put some poems together and talk about multiple poems, you can do that. You might want to run it by me first. We can certainly talk either through email or a video conference. But as, as long as you can connect them, you can probably make it work. But if you don't see a connection, then yeah, move on. So make your picks. Uh, choose your text. Do not leave the textbook, please. Uh, I would like us to stick with the book. It's so big. It has such a big selection. I think we can just stay there and find what we need. Um so just enjoy that. And, and if it means reading something new, then just think about that as part of your workload for this week. But if you can remember something, like I said, from an earlier week that you've already read, but you haven't written about it yet, go back to it. But if you do that, let me give you a little bit of advice. Don't rely entirely on your memory. You need to revisit the, the text, even if you've already read it. OK, even if you think you remember it pretty well, because one thing we're not doing in this class and it might have been a mistake on my part. This is the first time I've taught 203 in the summer. So I'm thinking in the future, I might make everybody do discussion posts, even though it's extra work uh, and we're already doing a lot of work each week. But uh, we haven't had a chance to write about a lot of the stuff that we've read. Typically, I make people write about our assigned text for each week. That's what we do in our discussion boards, but we don't really do regular discussion posts in this class. So if there's something you've been wanting to write about, but you just haven't had a chance, that's fine. But go back. You might want to reread it or at least reread parts of it. And that takes me to the next thing that's really important for early this week, a very important pre-writing activity, and that is annotating. You need to annotate your chosen text. Once you've made your selection, I'm going to write about this short story, I'm going to write about this play, or this poem, or these two poems. Once you've made your choice, go back to the text. And you really need to spend some time with it. This is a big part of pre-writing. And it's a big reason why we have a whole week to do pre-writing. Because when we're, when we're working on literature, we really have to engage closely with the text if we want to produce good analysis and interpretation. So you guys really need to revisit it. And you need to take notes, okay? Circle stuff, underline stuff. Highlight stuff. Look for the most important passages. Look for patterns. Look for repetition. Look for some of the elements that we've been talking about. And again, you can go back to the strategies for analysis. You can already start to do some of that stuff as you're revisiting your text. When you annotate, I, I mean, I talk about annotations with my 101 students, my 102 students, every class I teach because I think it's essential. you got to get some notes down. You're not going to remember everything about the text, even if you think you have a good memory. It's been proven by neuroscientists. Uh, humans do not remember what we read very effectively. We just don't. We remember stuff that happens to us a little bit better. We remember stuff that, you know, we have more of a direct role in. But when we're passively reading, well, hopefully it's not passive, but when we're reading something, uh, typically our retention is not as good as it might be with you know other activities 
So even if you're a good active reader, that's still true. So that's why you have to take notes. And a big part of being an active reader, honestly, is taking notes. I would actually argue that if you don't annotate, if you don't highlight and then write stuff down in the margins or you know on a separate sheet of paper as you're reading, I would argue that if you're not doing that, you actually are a passive reader. If you're just looking at your text, reading, okay, reading, 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 and then you're done, you might enjoy it. You're going to remember some things, but you're also going to forget a lot. You're going to overlook a lot of important details. And again, when you analyze, it's not enough to just remember what happened. Oh yeah, he dies at the end. I remember that. That's not enough, okay? You have to dig in a lot more. So that's why annotations are so important. And that's, again, it's a way to get started. It's a way to generate ideas because some of those notes that you take, you might revisit them. You might look at them later and say, oh, I think I'm actually on to something there. Or you might say, I'm just really interested in whatever I'm saying there. So I want to spend more time talking about it. All right. So the notes that you write down early in pre-writing, they can be very informal. OK, they're not for anybody but you. But you really need to start underlining, annotating, and asking some questions. And again, you can use the questions in my document that I posted, or you can just ask more general questions when you've gotten to the end of the text. Why did this happen? Why was the character motivated to do X? Why does the author want us to feel Y? Start answering some of those questions. Start thinking through anything that might initially puzzle you or anything that just might seem a little bit unresolved. That's, also, that's often a good starting point for analysis. Is there something mysterious in the text, something unexplained? Is there something that might be open for interpretation? We often see those moments or those items, those openings in a text where it's like maybe it means X or maybe it means Y. But you can't just leave it open-ended. You have to pick what does it mean? How should we read it? How should we understand the author's message? You have to start answering some of those questions. You don't have to have all the answers right away, but start asking yourself and start working through some potential answers. And like I said, some of those answers will become things that you might talk about, things that you might explore in your paper. All right, so you need to spend some time early this week just sitting down with your text. And another sort of pro tip if you're going to do high level uh, literary analysis, you really need to sort of earmark some passages. So again, you can do this whether you're reading the book in hard copy form or if you have an ebook. Either way, it's going to look a little different, but you need to find some important uh, sections or moments or scenes in the text. This is what I mean when I say you need textual examples. And if you read your feedback on some previous assignments, you'll notice that I've said that uh, to many of you in the past. Okay, that's a good point, but where's your example? A lot of times when you're working with literature, you have to show us. You can't just tell us. So if you're telling us that the author is using imagery to do A, B, and C, all right, fine. But you have to show us at least an example or two to drive the point home. If we can't see the imagery, if we can't read it, if we can't look at it for ourselves as readers, then your point isn't really going to land. We just have to take your word for it. Right? Well, he says that imagery does this. And maybe it does. I don't know. He's not showing me anything. Okay, so that's the importance of textual examples. You can't have an effective analysis without textual examples. It just, it's, just, it's just not possible. Okay, you're not engaging with the text if you're not providing examples. And I guarantee you what you're largely doing is summarizing. If you're, or maybe responding, but you're not analyzing. Okay, because the examples don't just illustrate points for readers, they also give you 
tangible, concrete things to work with. So when you bring in a direct quote from a character or a specific line from a poem, now you can do stuff with those examples. If it's a poem, you can scan it. Right. You can talk about meter or rhyme or you can just talk about other elements like imagery or symbolism. If it's a line of dialogue from a character in a short story, you can talk about that character. Why is that character saying this? What does this statement say about the character? You can do all kinds of stuff with those examples. Some examples you're just going to kind of work with briefly and then move on. Other examples from the text you might want a close read. You might want to spend an entire body paragraph exploring one of those specific examples. But you first have to find the examples that you want to use. So this is a real time saver. If you take my advice, start looking for examples in your text now, this week. Don't wait until next week. When you're in the middle of writing and now you have to go back to the book, okay, flip to the page, okay, all right, where, where was that one scene that I kind of remember from three days ago? See, that's sloppy and that leads to mistakes, that leads to kind of incomplete, insufficient analysis. That's where a lot of problems arise. If you get organized, okay, if you can write down the page numbers, oh, I got a great scene on page you know, 175, I'm going to go back there. Or if I have the hard copy, I know some of you might want to sell this book back, but I actually mark up the book. That means I annotate my chosen text and I'll sort of put brackets around the key passages or I might highlight it, you can underline it, or you can just make notes to yourself. If you don't want to mark up the book, just write down on a scrap piece of paper, here's all the examples that I want to use. One's on page five, one's on page 11, one's on page 20, and just have a little list that you can use later. I guarantee you that will save you a lot of time <laughs> and a lot of hassle when you're actually writing next week. So just work with the text, sit with the text, get to know that text. You need to be well acquainted with the text. And that might seem obvious, but a lot of times we don't think about that. We don't really uh, realize the importance of that. Make sure you're getting the little things about the text right as you're spending all of this time. Make sure you're getting the author's name right. Don't misspell the author's name. That's a bad sign. A lot of you on some of the previous assignments, you're getting some dates confused. You might be doing some Google searching about these authors. I've seen multiple times people telling me that a, a poem or a short story was written in the year that the author was born, which would be very impressive if true, if the author was actually producing fiction or poetry at one year of age or less than one year of age. That would obviously be very novel, but that's not the case, right? We're getting the dates confused. The book tells you the publication date for everything, okay? I know it's an easy thing to overlook. It's an easy thing to kind of take for granted, but it matters, okay? We, we are entering a professional realm now. So we have to be familiar with what we're working with. That's what's expected of professionals, okay? So we have to get the little details right, the spelling, the publication date, but we also have to show that we are comfortable and familiar with our text. Nothing undermines your argument more than showing that you don't really know your text that well. Maybe you read it once, but you've forgotten stuff and you're mostly just summarizing the plot and you're not digging deep and maybe your sources aren't really good sources. And that just shows a kind of lack of familiarity, a lack of engagement with the text. And that's obviously bad. So before you write anything, uh, in terms of a rough draft or, of course, a final draft, before you even think about that stuff, just sit with your text for a day, maybe two days. I would even recommend up to three days. Take some notes. Find some potential examples that you might want to use later on your paper. You don't have to stick to all of them. I always skew a little bit on the high side. 
So I might have a list of 10 examples. I might only use six, but it's always better to have too many than to not have enough. You can make some of those cuts, some of those choices later on. So do some of that work early this week. And then maybe a little bit later in the week, I want you guys to turn your attention to research. So we haven't talked about research in this class, but you guys have done it before. Uh, hopefully you did it a little bit in 101, and I'm pretty certain that all of you did at least some kind of research in 102, at least if you took 102 at GBC. Um, so we're not reinventing the wheel. We're doing the same type of research that you did in 102, which largely means we are using the GBC databases through the library webpage in addition to stuff like Google Scholar. And I'll talk more about that. Uh, so it's the same basic kind of stuff that you should have been doing in 102. But again, the difference now is that we are writing about and researching literature. So you're going to be looking at some different types of sources. Uh, your reading experience as you do your research might be a little bit different from some of the research you've done before. Again, in 102, a lot of our research ends up being like newspaper articles about current events or, you know, stuff we find on, you know, reputable websites. And that's fine in 102. And in some cases, uh, some of that stuff might work in here, but typically what we, what we want in 203, what we want when we're doing literary research, we want popular uh, scholarly literature journals. That's what we want. We don't really want websites. We don't want goodreads.com. We don't want spark notes or cliff notes or any of the limitless paper mills and summary websites that exist out there. And I know we've all seen them. Maybe some of us have used them before. I don't want those. Okay. Those are not valid sources for the kind of work we're doing. And I can't stop you guys from visiting those websites. I wish I could. Uh, but for an assignment like this, they don't help you unless you're just confused about something that happens in the plot and you want to look at a summary website to clear up a question that you have about when this character dies or when this other event happens, that's okay. I don't really care if you're just getting basic info. But if you think those sites are going to help you make an original argument, just think about it for a minute, right? Everybody has access to those sites. Students all over the world are using those sites. If you just take the stuff that you find on those paper mills and just regurgitate it, it's going to get flagged on my end in Canvas. It's going to get flagged as plagiarism. It happens every semester uh, in 203. It's just a reality. Some students just rip off websites and that stuff immediately gets flagged. And then I have to fail those students because, of course, that's the penalty for plagiarism. So just don't go down that road. Don't even mess with those sites, okay? As long as you have a good handle on your chosen text, if you know what it's about, you know what happens, yeah, you can visit Wikipedia and read about the author a little bit. You can do some simple Google searches, but just understand what that stuff is. That's just general info gathering, and it's fine. I do that. When I'm working on a project, I might hop on <laughs> Wikipedia for a minute, do a quick Google search, but that's not research. That's not real research. That's not what I mean when I say research. OK, so you guys can do some of that, you know, Googling early on, but then you need to transition to real heavy duty uh, scholarly research. That's the expectation at this level. In 102, I'm a little bit more lenient. At this level, we don't have any room to kind of play around and get sort of, you know, less than quality sources. So I'm just going to give you a few tips. Uh, hopefully we can all get to the GBC library homepage. If you guys want to go ahead and do that while I'm talking, that might be good. Some of you might need to figure out your login 
Uh, I can't help you with that. Okay, that's something you have to figure out. If you do need help, uh, technology services at GBC can help. And you can also call the library directly. I think they have limited summer hours, uh, but they should. somebody should be there uh, during typical work days, uh, typical weekdays. We do have a physical library located on our main campus in Elko. You don't have to physically go there in order to use the library, but in order to use the library, you have to log in. Uh, if you're using it remotely, which I think all of us probably are, uh, you got to have your login info squared away. Make sure you're using your GBC account. That's one tip I can use. If you're using your personal uh, Google account that's not affiliated with GBC, the library will not recognize you. Okay, but you all have GBC accounts. If you are a GBC student, you have one. You have an official GBC email and you have an official GBC Google account. And you, have, you should have a username and a password for that account. That's the info that you're going to need to get into the library. So get that squared away. If you're having trouble this week, don't panic. It's not a big deal, but just call the library, call tech services. And if you can't get a hold of anybody or if you can't get any answers, talk to me. I am not a tech guy. I'm not great at tech troubleshooting, but I can find you somebody who can help you. It probably won't be me. It'll be a librarian or a tech guy, but I'll find them. OK, if you're having trouble, talk to me, email me, but don't wait. OK, don't wait to get your research going in week eight. I want you to get your research going this week. So if you go to the library homepage, uh, you should see sort of like a little toolbar on the left hand side. And it sh you should. No, I'm sorry. It'll actually be kind of at the bottom of the screen. I'm not looking at it right now. I'm trying to think what it looks like. I think your options are kind of, if you scroll down a little bit, you should see a few different things. The catalog, uh, there might be a link for interlibrary loan, and there's going to be a link for databases. And that's really all we need. There's other features. If you guys ever have questions about other stuff that you can do through the library, again, talk to a librarian or let me know. I can get you connected to somebody. But really, for what we're doing right now, all you need is the databases. That's it. So click on that database link and it should take you to a new page. Uh, and you have an option there. You can look at all of the databases that we have access to. Again, this is all free, right? If you're a GBC student, uh, you have free access to all of the library databases. And this is the way to do the best research when you're looking for scholarly sources. You may have remembered that term from 102, sources written by critics, scholars, professors, experts, people who work in the field. It's a lot better than grabbing some paper that another undergraduate wrote at Western Oregon five years ago. That's what you're going to find on those paper mills. That's what you're going to find on those summary websites. It's all rehashed. It's all stuff that's already been written, already been said, already been done, right? And it's usually been done by amateurs, no offense, maybe smart amateurs. But you want the experts. You want the pros. So if you want work done by the pros, you need to go to the databases, okay? So once you get to the database page, you'll see the alphabetical option. You can take a look at all of them if you want. You don't really need to. Instead, you should see links for a couple of specific databases right beneath the alphabetical listing, okay? And these are really the only two <laughs> that you guys need. Uh, EBSCO and JSTOR. Okay, those are two big repositories. Like a lot of uh, scholarship is can be about all kinds of different disciplines. A lot of scholarship can be found there. Okay, and that's really what we're doing. We're producing scholarship of our own. That's what a literary research paper is. So again, this is literary criticism. Remember what we talked about last week? There's kind of two sorts of criticism. Evaluative, that's like a book review that you might find in a newspaper. And then there's interpretive criticism. And that's what we're doing but with a focus on analysis and interpretation. So that's what critics write. That's what scholars write. 
okay? Book reviews sometimes get written by the same people, but they're more often done by journalists, and they're more often found in newspapers and what we would call popular publications. What we want are scholarly publications, okay? There's a difference. Popular sources are fine in 102. In 203, I'll make an exception every now and again. If you have a good book review from like the New York Times book review, they have a kind of famous one, or maybe it's the New Yorker, I don't know, but one of those big papers will have very reputable book reviews. Sometimes those might work as sources, but you really want the stuff that you can find in JSTOR and EBSCO. So click on one of those. You don't have to use both. EBSCO might be enough for you. Uh, once you get inside EBSCO, you'll notice that it really is set up largely like Google. Just type in your search terms. You can search for your chosen text. You can just punch in the title. You can search for stuff written about the author. Or you can get more specific. Uh, if you know that this text belongs to a larger genre, if it's an example of I don't know, horror or a particular type of fiction or particular type of poetry. It's an elegy. It's, you know, a kitchen sink drama. Like if, if you know that that's what you're dealing with, we haven't talked a ton about genres, but sometimes the book might clue you in. Sometimes a quick Google search will clue you in. Again, that's fine stuff to do. Like what genre does this belong to? What else did this author write? You guys can use a simple Google search for that. But once you're inside the database, use your Googling instincts. It's, it's, it works the same way. You're just punching in search terms and you're looking through the results. Okay, but the good thing about JSTOR or EBSCO is all of your results are going to be good. They're all going to be reputable, peer-reviewed scholarship. Okay, peer reviewed means that before the article was published, it was reviewed by other experts in the field. So I'll just use myself as an example. I'm not trying to brag, but when I've published articles, I had to submit uh, my work, you know, to, uh, you know, whatever journal it is. And then they have readers, they have other professors, scholars, critics who will read that stuff and they'll either say, yeah, it's good, it's fit for publication, or they'll recommend some changes. They'll say, yeah, he needs to fix this. He needs to address that. He needs to rework his ending or whatever. And then I have to make those changes before it gets published. So that peer review process is part of what makes us trust these sources, okay? It's not just one person's idea. Other critics have signed off. The editorial board of the journal that it was published in, they signed off on it. Everybody looked at it. Everybody thought about it. And they said, yeah, it's good. It's accurate. Okay. You don't get that with a standard Google search. You might find good stuff in a standard Google search, but you're also going to find bad stuff, unhelpful stuff, stuff that you don't want. Okay. So that's why the databases are better. Now, like I said, EBSCO and JSTOR, they can satisfy all of your needs, really. Uh, but if you want to really do it like the pros, there's a specific database devoted to literature. So if you go back to the alphabetical listing, go to the M's, M as in Michael, and look for MLA, International Bibliography. You probably remember MLA. You know that we follow MLA rules in English classes. MLA just stands for the Modern Language Association. Uh, they govern a lot of things in English studies. So that database is really intended for English students, literature students, uh, people doing the kind of work that we're doing. A lot of times you'll find the same stuff in MLA that you would find in JSTOR. But you're going to get maybe more results in JSTOR because it's more interdisciplinary. There's other stuff. There's science stuff. There's history. There's social science. Uh, whereas MLA is a little more narrowly focused on lit and other stuff kind of related to lit. So you could find movie stuff as well probably. But any of those databases will work. Will work for you. 
You don't have to use MLA, International Bib, but that's what I use uh, when I do research. And it's easy to use. It's set up just like those others. Um, and they're right there at your fingertips. So there's not much of an excuse not to use the library databases. If you're having login issues, again, let me know or get in touch with the tech people or get in touch with uh, the library. And you can find the library contact info on the homepage. There's an email, there's a phone number, uh, there's lots of ways to get in touch. It does get a little tricky in the summer because our main librarian is off, just like I am often not working in the summer. But they usually have somebody there, an assistant, who can maybe help you or at least can kind of find uh, where you need to go. Okay, so spend a little bit of time researching later this week. You eventually will need two to three sources that you can use in your paper. So we don't need a ton of sources. I don't want you to drown in other people's ideas, but you do need at least two and no more than three. Okay, and largely I want peer-reviewed scholarly articles from literature journals. So I just have a few examples. I'm actually going to post this document that I'm looking at right now. I'm going to post it to the week seven module. It's just called research help. And it's basically giving you everything that I'm talking about right now. But just some examples of literature journals that you will find or see over the course of some of this research. Uh, new literary history, American literary history, contemporary literature, the Journal of Modern Literature, any publication connected to MLA uh, would be good. Critical Inquiry, the Journal of Literary Theory. We were talking about theory and criticism last week. The Journal of Postcolonial Writing, American Literature, Arizona Quarterly, Language and Literature, Notes and Queries. Uh, there's a lot more. That's just a small sampling, but... Those are the kinds of journals we're looking at. I'm not talking about Rolling Stone. I'm not talking about Newsweek. <laughs> I'm not talking about local newspapers. I'm talking about scholarly journals. And that's what you find when you're using the databases. You can also use books. There's lots of full-length books written about uh, texts and authors, literary texts and authors. You might not want to tackle an entire book. You might not have time to read an entire book as one of your sources. But remember, uh, you don't have to read the entire book. If it's a big work of scholarship, it's going to have a lot of individual chapters or sections uh, that might be about different things. Or they might be tackling specific aspects of an author or of a text. And you might just choose a particular chapter. I want chapter five. I don't want the rest of the book. That's fine. You can use that one chapter. That will count as a valid source. You can use ebooks. You can actually order books from the library, believe it or not. Not many people do that, but they will ship you books if you need something. But of course, ebooks work fine as well. So, uh, what you're looking for, again, is support for your points, support for your claims about the text. In some cases, it can be nice to find people who have the opposite position as you, people who have an opposite interpretation or they have a very different interpretation from you. You can use that stuff as well. You can use it to set up your own rebuttals, your own responses. Well, this person says this, but that's not really true. Instead, it's more like this. That can be an effective strategy when you're starting to build your paper. So that's an option. But what most people want, basically, it's much like 102. We want sources that will support what we are saying. They agree with me. They're saying something similar to me. Or you can take a point that one of these critics is making and you can build your own point on top of it. So they're arguing that imagery is important in this poem, and now you're going to make a more specific point about a specific example of imagery that you found, and you're going to use their uh, little thing to kind of support what you're saying. See, imagery is important. He says it. And now I'm going to show you a little bit more about why and how. 
Okay, that's kind of what you're doing with these sources. So again, the sources are not the star. You're the star. The sources are supporting actors. They are here to help you. They are here to make you look good. They are here to make you look knowledgeable. And you're going to use them to build your own argument. But don't get too focused on summarizing them. You do not need to summarize your sources. I don't really want you to. That's taking you away from your focus. Your focus is on the chosen literary text. The sources are supplemental. They are here to help you. But don't let them take center stage. Don't spend a whole page summarizing this article that you read. We don't want that. Okay? Tell us what's in that article that's important for you. Okay? What's in there that's going to help you? Okay, what's relevant? What specific parts of that article are you going to use? Okay, think about it that way. You can certainly quote the article. Okay, you can use it multiple times, but don't let it overwhelm your argument. Your argument's the focus. The sources are just helping sort of around that central argument of your own. So one more tip about research. If you're having trouble getting to the library databases or if you don't like them for some strange reason, there's one other really easy, good way to find scholarly sources, and that's Google Scholar. So I tell people about this in 102. Maybe you're aware of it. It's just like Google except for scholarly sources. So you can go to Google and search for Google Scholar. Okay, and then you'll go to a new page and just it basically works like our databases. You can search for your text, you can search for the author, or you can search for more specific things. But Google Scholar is going to only give you peer reviewed books and articles. The only downside with Google Scholar is you're not going to have access to the full text every time. So some of the things that show up when you click on the PDF or the HTML, it's going to take you to a new page where somebody wants you to pay up. Don't pay money for research. You never have to. Okay, You can find those same articles in EBSCO or JSTOR or MLA International Bib, and of course it's always free there. And with the GBC databases, you always have full text. That's why they're better. You always have access either to a PDF of the article or the book chapter, or you'll have a link to maybe, if it's a book, you might have a link to actually read the whole book or to at least see the table of contents, or you might have an HTML option. But you're always going to have access to the full text of the source. And of course, that's what we want. The source is not going to help you if you can't read the whole thing. Okay. And if you land on a website where they're like, want to keep reading? Give us $29.99 and you can have the article. Don't do that. If you really want that article, write down the name of the author, the title of the article, and then search for it in JSTOR or MLA International Bib or EBSCO. And I bet you you'll find it. I bet you can find it for free. We should never pay for research. That's a ripoff for students. If you're doing this work after your schooling is over, yeah, you might have to pay up. But as long as you have free access to the library, you should never pay for sources. Okay, so give yourself a couple of days for research. We're not doing really intensive research. But I want you guys to spend a little bit of time looking for your two to three sources before the end of this week. And then the final thing I want you guys to do this week is outline. So I posted, I will post yet another document about your outline, kind of a sample outline to just give you a guide, to give you an example of what your outline needs to look like. Now, everybody has their own outlining style. But the real goal, and again, this is the final part of pre-writing. The real goal with your outline is to have a plan. It's like the blueprint for your paper. So I always make this cheesy analogy. It, think about building a house. All right. Typically, you're going to have a plan. You're going to have something to follow, something to guide you before you start building. 
Okay, so the outline is your blueprint and the building process will start next week when you actually start writing your paper. So when you outline, you really need to plan each individual paragraph that's going to appear in your final paper. So you know there's going to be an introduction, and I'll show you this in my sample outline. You need to have your thesis in that intro. You need to introduce your chosen text and then drive home or, or introduce your argument, okay, your interpretation of that text. And then in your body paragraphs, you're going to drive home that argument. So you need to plan for a lot of of bodies. This is a pretty lengthy paper. It's not one of these short assignments that we've been doing so far. You need to plan many bodies, okay, at least five or six to start, and then you might want to add some more. You're not writing them yet, but you're figuring out what you think you're going to do in each one of those bodies, okay? So in my first body, I'm going to talk about imagery. I'm going to make this point, and this point, I'm going to use this example and maybe this other example. Moving on. In my next body, I'm going to talk about this character. I'm going to offer this example of the character doing some weird thing. I'm going to talk about this other thing the character does. I'm going to bring in one of my sources who also talks about this character. Okay, that's my next body. Okay, now I'm moving on to my third body. That's what I mean. You don't have to write all of these sentences yet. But for each body, go ahead and have a topic sentence or at least a topic for that paragraph in mind. What am I going to be talking about in this paragraph? What literary element am I exploring? What examples from the text am I using? Am I using a source? What am I saying? What are my original points? Uh, you might use a shorthand. You might just say, look at notes. <laughs> look at my notes on imagery. That's what I'm going to get into in this paragraph, but you need to have a plan. And then, of course, wrap things up with a concluding paragraph. So have a brief plan. You can use bullet points, whatever, but have a brief plan for each paragraph that you're intending to write. And again, use my example. Uh, use all of the stuff that you see in the week seven module. If you have a question about, if you have questions about any of it, let me know. Uh, I would love to hear from you guys, either this week or next. So if you have questions, you can email me. We can also do a video conference. I know a lot of people don't want to, but if you want me to maybe look at your outline or look at a draft with you, if you have specific questions, we can do a video conference through Cranium Cafe in Canvas, and you'll actually be able to upload documents so we can both look at an outline or a draft whatever you want. Just get in touch. Don't hesitate. We have a lot to do this week and next. So communication is important. Staying on schedule is important. So by the end of this week, you have your text. You've spent time with your text. You've read it a second time, or you've at least gone back and reread parts of it. You've taken notes. You've generated some ideas. You have an outline, and you've started your research. One final thing I wanted to say about research, with older, really well-known texts, like anything by Poe or some famous author, you're going to find a lot of sources on it. You guys can probably imagine. With famous stuff that's been around and has been taught and read a lot, you're going to find a lot of sources. Stuff that's more contemporary, it hasn't been around as long, that stuff typically won't have as many sources written about it, but that's okay. Another thing to remember is that not all of your sources have to be specifically about your chosen text. If your chosen text is an example of a particular genre, or if it's doing something that another text kind of does, you can find a source that talks about the larger genre or talks about a different but related text. You can make that work. Um, it's just really up to you. It, it's based on what you find, what kind of argument you want to make, and what you want to do. But, uh, you know, if you're having any issues with research, let me know. I think we've all done it enough by now to be pretty comfortable. But if you don't feel like you're finding good scholarly sources, let me know. I'll be able to help. And if you can 
if you can achieve all of those goals, you know, uh, all the stuff I just listed by the end of this week, then next week we can move on to drafting. That means putting together a rough draft that we can later revise and edit, and then we'll turn it into a final draft, and that final draft is what we turn in on August 9th. But you'll notice the assignment that's due this week, we actually have two, a very easy discussion post where you're just telling me about your research, inform me about your research. If you have questions, that can be a forum to ask them as well. Just give me an update. How's it going? What are you finding? How do you feel? Very informal. And then the other assignment is an option. It's either an outline, okay? Everybody should be ready to outline by the end of this week, or you can submit a rough draft. If you're working fast, if you're ready to have a rough draft by the end of this week, great. But that is not mandatory, okay? And really, my preference would just be to see an outline from everybody. And then we have time next week to put together rough drafts, and then we'll talk about revising and editing, okay? So if you have any questions, let me know, and then tune in for our final lecture next week. I'll see you then.